we have to know teams. All right, good evening, everyone. My name is Kit Van Wagner, and I'm Director of Operations with Dresser Marine, which is the parent company for Confident Captain and the Professional Captains Association. And welcome to the December Pro Seminar Series. Um, we are here this evening with Dan Soma. Um, this is part of a professional series for captains with um, licenses less than 200 gross tons. Uh, we're the Professional Captains Association supporting these captains. Um, and as part of our professional development, we offer these monthly seminars during the winter months with a host of different topics. So we have some great speakers lined up for entering into 2022. I hope you'll all be able to join us again. And uh, it's my privilege this evening to introduce Dan Soma. Um, Dan and I met in the Florida Keys back in the mid 90s. So we've known each other for quite some time. Um, from afar, I've been uh, impressed to follow his career and his progression through the Coast Guard, um, achieving the rank of, of commander. And now he's working in a, a big role with a lot of responsibility at Marathon, overseeing dock safety and um, compliance. And I think it's an area that often gets overlooked uh, in safety audits and safety management, risk management. So I think it's a great opportunity for us to take a look at this field this evening. Um, this presentation is being recorded. It will be archived on our YouTube channel and uh, that link will go out in our next uh, Captain's Dispatch, our newsletter. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dan. If I could ask everyone just to mute yourself during the presentation, um, keep note of those questions that you might have for Dan, and we will have a question and answer at the end of the seminar. So I'm gonna mute myself and I'm going to put Dan in spotlight. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening. Yeah, hi. Well, thanks, Kit, for the great uh, the great intro intro. And um, yes, we met in the Florida Keys in the mid '90s, um, and working on small passenger vessels at uh, uh, Newfound Harbor Marine Institute in the big, in Big Pine. It was a great great time, and uh, we both got a lot of a lot of sea time there. And that was probably the first time where I thought seriously about a career in the Coast Guard, um, uh, operating small boats and really just enjoying the keys and uh, the, the whole lifestyle there. Um, so uh, welcome tonight, we're gonna talk about dock safety and emergency preparedness. Um, I have a few slides um, to go through, but I hope we have some discussion as well at the, at the end. Um, definitely have time for questions. Um, what I learned in the Coast Guard and what I've sort of carried through in, in with Marathon is that um, there's no, um, it's, it's hard to categorize when it comes to working on the docks or, or uh, Maritime. You have to be able to do multiple things. It, it, you have to be able to think as a safety professional, but also as an emergency manager and also as an environmental professional. So there's three kind of roles that I fill at Marathon. Um, I have to think about all three. You know, we don't want to have anyone get hurt. We want to be ready for emergencies when they happen. And then we also want to protect the environment. So all those things are really important and have to be part of your, your doc program. Uh, a little about me, I'm, my formal title is Marine Terminal Compliance Advisor. Um, it's a role that didn't really exist uh, a few years ago when I was hired. I was hired as an emergency preparedness coordinator. Um, so what I do now and what I started doing is a little different. Um, when I, as emergency preparedness coordinator, I was running drills and exercises for about 80 uh, oil terminals in our midstream business at Marathon. So that's midstream is pipeline, terminals, marine. It's, it's the logistics and storage of, of product. That's, that's midstream business. 
And then I evolved into a more doc centric role. Um, right now I support uh, just over 40 docs in 11 states. And um, by docs, I mean doc terminals. Some terminals have more than one doc. And um, so, and, and we can be operating in uh, whether it's brown water, blue water, uh, rivers, and I have a slide, I'll show you the, show you the map um, in, a, in a minute. Uh, my Coast Guard career was, uh, I, I had a great Coast Guard career. I, I loved, honestly, I loved every minute of it. Um, I did everything from oil spill response to uh, marine inspection. So I, I was a barge inspector, tow and vessel inspector, cruise ship inspector, tank vessel, Inspector, I was um, I was uh, on a on a on an armed boarding team, so I did port state control and uh, unarmed, and then I also did uh, sea marshal and uh, uh, boarding team member as a, as an armed uh, member as well. Um, I spent that was in the port of New York and port of Seattle, and then I did a staff tour in D.C. Um, I was in the TWIC and MTSA office, so uh, I traveled around the country in the uh, 05, 06 time frame, promoting the Mar Maritime Transportation Security Act as well as TWIC card, and so those of you in maritime know the TWIC card. Um, I had a great experience. I had great leaders and managers there when I was at headquarters. Um, promoting a very difficult program that the marine industry really had to uh, embrace. Uh, I got to speak with a lot of mariners and I learned a lot about the, about industry and also that, you know, the TWIC card fixed some problems, but didn't fix everything. And, and we could have a whole night on, on TWIC, but, um, and after that experience, I went over to Military Sealift Command. So I was Coast Guard Liaison Officer, um, working for about 150 non-combatant ships. So those of you in uh, maritime with licenses and will know Military Sealift Command, they're a great employer. Um, and I worked around, around the world, really, uh, worked on safety management systems, um, for vessels in, in the Mediterranean. Um, also worked on um, some different uh, Department of Defense command and control platforms and missile defense platforms in the Pacific and had some really exciting experiences with, with, uh, with those programs. Anything that didn't um, you know, have Navy guns on it was under the, uh, is under military seal of command, if you can think of it that way. And then wound up in uh, the Great Lakes. I was the prevention department head and um, leading compliance for facilities and vessels on Lake Michigan. And then um, was promoted deputy commander. So ran all of those programs plus search and rescue and 23 Coast Guard stations. So that's the picture you see there is um, a part of being a search and rescue mission coordinator, you have to learn uh, uh, the, the assets. And so you gotta get, get out and fly with the, uh, the pilots. And so I got to do uh, quite a bit of uh, work there with the, with the helicopters and uh, our search and rescue assets on the lake, primarily small boats and, and the uh, HH-65. Um, since joining Marathon, though, I've I've had to straddle both those worlds, prevention and response. So, um, at Marathon has a, had a strong dock safety program. There there was a death in 2010, unfortunately, from a from a person in water situation um, at one of our off one of our towing vessels at one of our docks, and Marathon began a very robust. Uh, overhaul of, of dock safety. Um, by the time I was hired in 2018, there were uh, areas that the company wanted to continue and improve on. Uh, so we uh, improved audits, weekly inspections, and now we run uh, 
rescue drills as well. And all of these are above and beyond what's required by the Coast Guard or OSHA. It's, it's just marathon policies that are driving it. And um, also at Marathon, we are very aware of extreme weather um, in, around our maritime areas. We have, uh, you know, like I mentioned, we've got dock locations around the country. And uh, as you all are aware, you know, extreme weather is, um, it's the now, it's the norm. So we can, that 100 year storm seems to come every year, right? And so every year is hurricane. We're, we're having big hurricanes, uh, big storms. Um, and so the maritime industry has to, has to adjust to that. And, and Mar Marathon is a very robust uh, effort in this regard. Um, the, as you can see, we, so Marathon Logistics and Storage has uh, just over, 40 dock locations around the country. And these are a combination of blue water and brown water. So um, the legacy initial, uh, you know, Marathon uh, it, headquarters is in Findlay, Ohio. Um, and sort of the legacy business was uh, based around the Ohio River. So Marathon uh, began as a brown water transportation company uh, oil company and over the years has grown uh, and acquired other companies and uh, most recently uh, expanded to the west coast and so uh, we have now have dock locations uh, in Washington state um, in California in, in uh, Alaska Florida Louisiana and uh, acquired New York Buffalo New York just Two years ago, and and then our our uh, earlier core business was around the Ohio River, uh, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Kentucky, and Tennessee. So, um, we uh, so in a few years ago, I underwent Marathon has a continuous improvement program that we, we use for lots of things. Um, we decided to use it for dock safety. And so we went through a rigorous um, process of looking at stem to stern, all aspects of our dock program. And um, we um, went through over 50 documents related to dock safety and uh, visited just about every uh, every dock uh, in the company, doing audits and visits and observations. Um, and we looked at the end of this, we decided that we had uh, three pillars. We decided that we had a hazard recognition pillar, a prevention and a response pillar. So from my Coast Guard background, we, I'm familiar with prevention and response. And we added hazard recognition because uh, the oil companies and Marathon in particular does a really good job here with recognizing hazards. So even before you decide on how you're going to prevent an accident, you need to recognize the hazard. And so we color coded these similar to the Coast Guard's GAR model, green, yellow, red. So green being this is where we want to be in the hazard rec phase. We want to be observing. Um, we want to be doing training. We want to be constantly think about how we can prevent uh, hazards. Then in the yellow, we say, okay, what can we do um, to prevent? Do we are we going to do engineering controls, installing handrails? Are we going to be uh, looking at our PPE, um, improving our PPE requirements, or looking at fall protection requirements? And then on a response side, we don't want to have to be here, but we're ready to respond if we have to. So do we have AEDs uh, on the docks ready to go in case we need them? Um, do people know what to do in a response? And I would say that coming from the Coast Guard to Marathon, I would say that the uh, in operations, in marine operations, 
marine operators and licensed mariners do really well in the in the the green and yellow and then there's always training though in the red and i'm not saying that mariners aren't good emergency responders as a matter of fact they're excellent emergency responders but when you're talking about shore-based uh, facilities you're in a regulatory environment you need to be able to follow your plans tightly make all your notifications correctly and ensure that all parties um, are aware and are fully notified when they need to be. And that might be a little different than when you're at sea. Um, you, it's more about saving the ship and taking care of business on the ship. Uh, at the dock locations, we want to really emphasize the, the, that we are in the community, right? We have neighbors there around us and we have relationships with um, our stakeholders, relationships with our customers, relationships with the local responders. So um, we really work on these areas. Um, one of these responses that a recent one was Hurricane Ida, um, which came through um, uh, Louisiana, it actually just missed New Orleans. Um, and we, um, there was widespread power outages, refineries and terminals shut down. There were a lot of barge breakaways. This was on the Mississippi River, this photo. And our merchant captains and our merchant mariners and, and dock personnel really had to step up. So you can see here, this was a, a barge breakaway that hit our Garyville refinery dock. And these are coal barges, um, uh, freight barges. They're not, they're not marathon property. But this happens on the river. You have, to, you have these situations where you have to do damage assessment. You have to follow procedures and look at how, how are we going to get these barges collected and moved? Um, what assistance do we need, whether it's from the Army Corps of Engineers or the Coast Guard? Uh, in this scenario, we were uh, the uh, Southern Louisiana pilots were very important in coming out, um, using their small boats to do surveys of the river at the river bottom and look at is it even safe to operate? Can we bring a towing vessel in here to grab these barges, or are there hazards underneath the water? Do we do we need to do side scan sonar beforehand? So there's a lot of steps that go into um, responding and we had to rely on you know professional captains like yourselves to come in and help help us uh with um the sonar the side scan process uh doing survey work um running uh running crews out to uh towing vessels out to other barges and then eventually we had um you know obviously towing capabilities towing vessels came and grabbed these these barges got us away from our dock so um being in 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 oil in in energy industry you never want to be down you never want to have downtime so we had we did lose dock availability here but the whole port was shut down so it wasn't like there was a, a competitive advantage to being open because we couldn't get any vessels in but the, we work closely with the Coast Guard, uh, regular calls to, to get the latest and get the port opened um, as soon as we could. And actually, um, the captain of the port in New Orleans, I, I think, did a fantastic job of being very transparent and on all the calls with us to help us um, have minute, up to minute information. So we really rely on those relationships. Um, so that was Ida, that was a, a recent event. Um, another one that I like to talk about is Maria. And this, this was before uh, I joined Marathon. This was during my Coast Guard uh, tour. Um, to give some background, the Coast Guard maintains uh, across the country, a group of uh, qualified incident commanders. So I was one of those. And so when you have a big event um, in, it, it, you know, in the Caribbean, um, you you exhaust the resources there pretty quickly, so people get burnout. And um, 
you bring in somebody like me who's active duty location is in Milwaukee, but I have a qual I was qualified as an instant manager, so I went to uh, to San Juan. And here um, you can see the um, merchant uh, fleet is really important, and and I and I consider the comfort, the hospital ship in that category. Yes, they're a U.S. Uh, naval ship, but they're crewed by uh, civilian mariners. So uh, on that ship, you have uh, medical professionals as well as a whole civilian crew uh, of merchant mariners that sailed the comfort. And um, while uh, when the comfort came into port, there was a lot of uh, so I was there as an instant commander and comfort coming to port. Uh, we knew that initially it takes a bit of time for the Navy to clear people to actually come on board and get treatment. But it's just that psychological effect of the big hospital ship coming that I think really helped a lot of the people who were suffering. The, the island had no power. Um, there was uh, no running water in most locations. There was very little food. Uh, available stores were not open. Um, we we often went out into the community, and um, I was told before coming down to bring cash, which I did. I took a lot of cash with me, more than the government provided, because there was um, in order to get uh, whether it was to get meals, um, there wasn't enough food, so we would uh, pay for meals um, as responders. We would uh, pay local people who were making different meals out of their houses or selling out of the back of a car, you, would, you could buy a meal. Um, we had, uh, so it was very much like, a, uh, I, I told a Kid earlier, it was like survi a survivor episode. It was, uh, you were really just trying to do the basics. And with that, if you look on the, the left there, that's, our, that's the um, fast response cutter um, that the Coast Guard, these were fairly new in 2017 when, when this incident occurred. And for those, um, if you're a, a ship nerd like I am, a cutter nerd like I am, um, these, were, we, these were built very exciting platforms for the Coast Guard because at 154 feet with a five day range, you could put a junior officer uh, as a commanding officer of these. So you might have a lieutenant junior grade or a lieutenant uh, with a small crew, crew of 15 or 20. And if you're a young lieutenant in the Coast Guard and you get assigned one of these cutters, it's very exciting because you get to basically uh, get a lot of operational experience at a young age. Um, and these were fantastic assets during the the hurricane, uh, after the hurricane, I should say, because a lot of the work we needed to do was getting supplies distributed around the island. A lot of the roads were knocked down. There wasn't power. The trees were covering the roadways. So the Coast Guard was relied on to do a lot of um, humanitarian support. Um, the one Achilles heel of these vessels was a, a five-day uh, working range. So they couldn't stay on station as long as they need to. And they, they did need maintenance at some point and we had to um, arrange for all that, but they proved vital during their response and deserve some credit. Um, and, and here's, this is an incident management team, a typical Coast Guard incident management team that gets deployed. So we came down from Clearwater, Florida in a C-130. Um, Fantastic aircraft. If you like are interested in aircraft, um, that could be a whole other talk. Coast Guard aircraft. The C-130. Um, I think we're on the C-130J now. Um, first one rolled off the assembly lines in 1954. Uh, they are still making them. They're, it's, they're a terrific, uh, a, a affordable, great use of taxpayer money. They can haul cargo, they can haul people, um, and uh, the Coast Guard has used them for many years and got us 
down from uh, Clearwater to San Juan. And um, we landed as in this picture, as soon as we landed, um, the National Guard arrived and they provided us an escort out of the airport. There was minimal security and a lot of uh, con uh, safety concerns initially. So we were, we were escorted, but a typical Coast Guard team like this has incident management uh, professionals on it. Um, critical incident stress managers. So, it's, so we dealt a lot with people that were very, uh, uh, had been at the end of their rope, uh, literally because of uh, stress they were dealing with without have, having power and running water. So we hadn't qualified trained people to say inter, uh, interdict there. We also had translators in this group. Um, and an interesting point, um, our translators did a great job, but we had to, one of the decisions I made was um, I uh, requested Puerto Rican translators, not just Spanish speakers, but Spanish speakers that grew up in Puerto Rico for two reasons. One, Spanish is a little different than other parts of the country. Um, and two, uh, those who had been impacted, who had family members there, so we had, uh, Coast Guard members who grew up in Puerto Rico who were concerned about their families, who better to send back to Puerto Rico to help than somebody who knows the island and can speak the language. So that was something we, we implemented. And I, um, so a lot of lessons there in, in Maria it was really a great, great experience. Um, and then a third one I thought would be appropriate to mention was Deepwater Horizon. Um, I was a shoreline group superv uh, supervisor and a federal on-scene coordinator. And so every morning I would get up in the, in the helo and look for oil. And then we would uh, know where the oil was located. And then we would dispatch uh, small boats, uh, with oil spill response equipment into the oil for cleanup. We also had observer type vessels that we sent out looking for oil. And those were like local licensed mariners that uh, could operate small boats, um, knew, the, knew the waters. This is off Grand Isle, Louisiana, which is uh, the southernmost, really the only um, continuous beach in Louisiana. There's about an eight, eight mile stretch of Louis, uh, beach. And these, there's some uh, islands just off of that. And you can see the, the product we were dealing with in this case was uh, kind of a bright red. It had been, if you recall, they um, were using dispersants uh, at the wellhead. So a lot of the oil was coming in was pretty bright red and orange. Um, and uh, you can see like it, it would heavily stain. So we would note this in the, in the helo and try to get uh, you know, vector response uh, resources into it. Um, and of course, now that I'm working for an oil company, um, I, we, this is not a situation an oil company ever wants to be in. So we do um, lots of training, uh, lots of planning to make sure we're ready if something like this were to occur again. And, um, and that's everything from response planning to, drilling with our, uh, our, our internal team and also drilling with the Coast Guard. So one thing that I always do if I'm running a drill for Marathon is I always invite the Coast Guard, I invite the state, the EPA, I invite OSHA, I invite, if there's a party that I think could help us be a better responder, um, I invite them and I, and I get their feedback. And, um, it's a really good good way to make sure that your plans and you're you're ready to go. Um, I have a when I was um, preparing this uh, slide deck, I have a a trusted colleague in within Marathon who's also from the Coast Guard, and I was talking to him about it, and he and uh, I I said, you know, I really want to I really want to talk. I'm, I'm on the terminal side. I'm not, I don't represent the towing vessels, but I said, I really want to, I really want to talk about our Marine group because they do such a great job. So um, we, 
looking at marine and since you're your licensed captains is um you know maritime mobility is key so being able to move product if a pipeline uh is down for some reason there's a, a valve closed uh or there's a some restriction to operation for some reason we then can shift to marine mode we can put product and barges moving on the river if um there was a cyber attack, which which actually happened, and not on our equipment, but one happened, and all the uh, a lot of the transport trucks were tied up moving product uh, because the pipeline wasn't working on the east coast. We then can move product on the rivers, so we use we use uh, our marine our towing vessels to do that, um, and merchant mariners are a key part of that. I mean, we are. Uh, you know, towing vessel uh, uh, master is a licensed member of the maritime community. So really, uh, a really important um, roles for the merchant mariner and uh, uh, in, in moving product and just having, you know, maritime resumption and maritime mobility in our country is just key. And it's, it's one of the things that really makes America a strong country is we, we, we do have a uh, terrific maritime industry that can respond and, and help us move products uh, and people in, you know, in, in the times when we need it. Um, so, so I'm right there, right around the, checking my watch there. And um, I see I'm just around the 30 minute mark, which is my plan. Um, I'm um, so I, I hope I had some some interesting insights for you all uh, at, at the Professional Captains Association. Um, and um, if you have any questions or feedback, I'd love to love to hear anything. Dan, thank you so much. Um, this is super insightful and, and interesting. Um, I have I have a question. Just as I was watching. You, you know, you've clearly worked on some really big projects and big undertakings. And I wonder if you could scale down a little bit of advice for small boat captains who want to, you know, uphold those three pillars you talked about. So hazard recognition and prevention. Um, what What's a good formula for them to approach trying to you know, keep their safety records high, keep everything, you know, working well, working safely. Um, do you have any advice for, for folks who want to do this on a much smaller scale than what you've been involved in? Right, that's a, that's a great question. Yeah, so what we do, um, so when I got hired at Marathon, I kind of dragged over some uh, best practices I, that we learned, uh, you know, in the Coast Guard. And so, one thing when I was uh, deputy, I learned uh, during my station visits how the importance of the boat check. So um, all of our Coast Guard boats get a daily boat check. And it's, we don't want to, and I adopted that policy on, of, for dock terminals. So dock locations, we don't want to have something that gets pencil whipped. We want to actually have uh, a checklist. Checklists are great, um, but that's insightful to your uh, operation. And a good example, I think, for this is um, when I've done marine inspection on lots of small, uh, on subchapter T boats, right? Small passenger vessels. If I see a life ring that's decayed or the, the line on a throw ring that's decayed. I'm not so much worried about the throw ring as I am the whole process behind that. And, and that goes for our own docks at Marathon or a small passenger vessel. So if, you're, if your life jackets are covered in oil uh, and have all the buckles broken and probably don't float, uh, or if they did, they would create a sheen, right? We, we, that's not what we're striving for. And so we have to ask, 
how did we get, you know, how do we get here? Uh, what is the system behind this? So, and if we peel, we, if we go back, we look at, is there a, do we have a system for ordering equipment? Do we even know where we're supposed to order the equipment from? Do we have the right accounting to do that? Do we, are we going to do it by credit card or is there, a, we're going to create an, a bigger account um, with uh, a, a supplier so that it's easy to order the right stuff and get the right stuff. Um, a lot of times everybody wants to do the right thing, but they just don't know how to order it or they're not sure um, um, how, you know, how to do it. And so you have to make that easy. So if you're gonna have a checklist, you should have in there, what's the vendor we're gonna use? What's the salesperson's phone number? I, uh, we could do online, but I, me personally with our, uh, systems we always have a vendor name a salesperson you know point of contact with a phone number that knows our business that can get us what we need and especially when you look at like oil response equipment like boom the, it gets confusing quickly as to what you really need so having having like a good sales person that knows your business and that can it might cost a little bit more, but it, but it's worth it. So really doing that daily check or weekly check. Maybe you're you're running a small boat that's not being worked every day uh, prior to operation, and then having an audit program. You remember the Coast Guard is not your auditor. So um, so many boats I would go to. Um, where just things weren't ready because they felt that the the Coast Guard was going to find whatever the Coast Guard found, they would fix. And so you wound up with a work list of 50 items. So it, when I was an inspector in New York, we came up with like a, a five item rule. Like if you, if once you hit five items, you'd say like, hey, I, I don't want to sit here and write 10 items. Why don't I just, why don't I give you another week? I'll come back you obviously aren't ready yet. Um, here's five to start with and I'll come back and finish uh, later. So you don't wanna have that situation. You wanna have a, a program where you're ahead of the game and you're inspection ready. So that's really having an internal audit program where either you or, um, and, and if you don't wanna pay for an external auditor, you could uh, do, you know, with a, a neighbor's boat, someone else's uh, equipment, and you swap. So you look at each other's stuff. Um, so those are some uh, some items, and then kind of leave the regulate. You know, the the, the Coast Guard will will help for sure, but um, not making them get too far involved in your program. You know, you want to have everything ready uh, ahead of time, and and all their checklists are pretty much published somewhere and you just have to ask for them or look for them online uh, to see what the key items are. Um, I think that's so important that what you mentioned about, um, you know, a rotted uh, ring buoy, it's a symptom of a much deeper problem. So I think that's a really good lens for, for folks to be thinking through, you know, if, if gear is out of date or expired or not working, um, yes, it's a problem that that piece of equipment is not ready, but there's a whole chain of events that's led up to that being the case. Um, so that's, thank you for that. That's, that's some great insight there. Um, we had another question from Pam. I see you're, you're there, Pam. Did you wanna ask your question directly? She wrote it into the chat, so I can ask it for you, or you want me to do it? It's in the chat. Sorry, I'm in a restaurant. No, no, go ahead. Oh, I can, I'll, I'll read it, I'll read it. So it says, um, thank you for your service. So in catastrophic events like mentioned, how does the US Coast Guard reach out to individuals that are licensed captains on a small scale to help out? I know my application when I got my six pack asked us if we wanted to be part of an emergency response team. Does the USCG reach out to mariners like us? Uh, definitely. Um, I think a great example was um, 
during during Deepwater Horizon, there were there were a lot of in southern Louisiana, there were a lot of public meetings uh, that were held, and um, during those those meetings, um, the 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 ideal situation is you have the uh, the the local uh, government parish government uh, parish official or county official present. You have a coast guard and then the res responsible party um, at these meetings together, talking to the community about what is being done. Um, and at those meetings, there's. Uh, websites provided, uh, signups provided for those who want to help or uh, get paid and get paid for their efforts. So if you have a vessel that's not working, a fishing vessel, for example, that's not working during the spill, you can um, uh, sign up yeah, for that. Um, I know another example was I, I actually uh, got a call from a from a friend who was a licensed uh, mate and um, after Irma and if you remember Hurricane Irma swept through the Florida Keys and did a lot of damage uh, to to the Keys uh, in in Florida and there was um, a, definitely a, a need for a towing vessel the personnel. Um, that there just weren't enough in the keys. Um, so um, we were able to connect him with the Coast Guard sector in Key West and the Coast Guard sector in Miami, which were maintaining lists of mariners that could work. The challenge there was, was finding lodging for them in the interim. So um, that can, that is always that is always a problem and still is a problem today when we have these events. If it's not, uh, if there's not lodging available, it's hard to get down close. Um, but if you're willing to uh, stay a little bit far away or maybe sleep in a car one night, usually we can, you know, they, those things can be worked through. Um, it's definitely not a perfect system. Um, but one thing I've been really impressed with is, is if you follow uh, Team Rubicon, who I got to know uh, a bit uh, after Har Hurricane Harvey and Irma, they just do a great job. So you, you can list your skills. Of course, they're a volunteer group, but that's if you, if you get down, you know, the key is getting to the site. So if you want to just be known and you have your skills listed, I think that's a great organization to look at as well as, as signing up with them. Um, you just have to take, um, uh, you have to have incident command system, I think 100, which is the basic level. And uh, I, I think a current medical record um, on file. So there, there are definitely uh, a few ways to do it. And, and I, imagine, I imagine FEMA has some, uh, some better systems as well. Uh, that have evolved over the last few years. Great, thank you for that. I, I, Team Rubicon is an amazing organization. I've been following them for years. Um, they deal a lot with veterans and and you know helping after massive catastrophic events. So that's a good recommendation. Um, I'd just like to find out if there's anyone else on the live forum here who has a question for Dan. Feel free to unmute yourself and jump in. Thank you, Pam, for your question. Good evening. Hi there, is this Mike? It is. Hi, Mike. Hey, Dan, I appreciate all your help and uh, your advice. Uh, well worth the time uh, invested. And hey, a couple of questions. Number one, um, is there any danger or hazard that you've seen from in-water electrocution at your docks from stray electrical power in the water? It's particularly more dangerous in fresh water and brackish water than salt water. Thank you. 
the 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 short answer is well maybe there isn't a short answer though the uh oil companies are always concerned about straight current um st static electricity especially so um when product moves quickly through steel pipes there's a potential for static charge so all that has to be grounded um and the when our when our docks are when marathon docks are constructed they are um uh, done so in such a way that all that piping is is grounded um and you know and vessels too have concerns with currents so you have your uh you know i have many times we would come into the, the uh you know the shipyard and the uh for the dry dock right and you get the barge up or you get the towing vessel up and there's not a all the zincs are gone and that's okay but then you'll be talking to the yard workers and they'll say wow we we replaced the those zincs six months ago in a in a dry dock we didn't tell you about and so you have to ask yourself well why are they going through the zinc so quickly um straight current somewhere in the boat so Definitely, uh, uh, we want to be want to be aware of it. Um, there, there are places where we intentionally put current into the water. And if you've ever transited uh, through Chicago, if you come down through Lake Michigan and go down the uh, the uh, Chicago River to the uh, Illinois River and then down the Mississippi, in in there is a fish barrier there, and you can. Um, the, if you were to fall overboard around Romeoville, Illinois, you would uh, not survive. The, there is uh, uh, 20,000 volts uh, going through the river there. That is to protect the Mississippi Basin and the, uh, that's to protect Lake Michigan from uh, the Asian carp. Um, so there are places where those fish barriers are used. Um, and we, as inland water operators, we have to deal with them. It's not, it's, they're not preferred. Uh, I don't think any mariner wants to deal with that, but you have to outweigh the consequences if, if certain fish species were to get into the lake, what would, what would happen? Um, and there's a healthy debate on that, whether they would actually uh, survive. Um, but uh, to kind of summarize, I don't, we haven't had, uh, in my three years, we haven't had any uh, situations where electricity in the, in the water was uh, a concern or, or created a hazard, but I, I can tell you that our engineers do uh, design the equipment very specifically to protect against the electrical threat. Yeah, it sounds like you commercial guys are way ahead of uh, the yacht clubs and marinas and so forth. It seems like it's a much bigger hazard that they're not really aware of. Yes, I, uh, I mean, we did a, uh, a dock replacement this summer uh, at Mount Vernon, uh, Indiana, which uh, is a floating dock so it's really uh it's a steel it looks like and, and acts like a barge it's a steel barge it's a floating dock it floats up and down but it obviously is made of steel and so there's a lot of concerns there with uh current and i'm not a, i'm not an engineer but um the design team when we do that kind of thing um spends really 18 months or more on the on the outside designing the barge and uh, considering all the aspects of static electricity and straight current and intrinsically safe wiring. So I know that that's that intrinsically safe wiring isn't necessarily part of like yacht club docks, but for the oil industry, they, they um, do do make great efforts to make uh, lighting intrinsically safe and um the uh, person in charge shacks intrinsically safe and equipment in those shacks 
uh, to really minimize any kind of sp uh, spark hazard. Thank you for that, Dan. Um, I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. If there's uh, anything, I see one coming in on the chat here. Um, we lived in Finley, Ohio for 20 years, know a lot about Marathon, now a trawler captain in Chilmark, Mass. Appreciate your time, Dan, okay. as well as the host for these meetings. Thank you very much for that input. Um, any, any final questions before we sign off here this evening? And um, do remember this, this presentation will be archived on our YouTube channel. I believe that's under the Confident Captain moniker, but we will um, put the link in the next newsletter. You can also just search for it on YouTube. Uh, that should be live by tomorrow. And I'll give it one more shot if there's anyone who has another question before we sign off here. All right, Dan, you've done it. You, you answered everything. And answered all the questions. Oh, that's great. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Dan, for your time. Thank you all for supporting the Professional Captains Association. Um, really appreciate it. It's been a great evening, and we look forward to seeing you in January for the next one. Take care, everyone. Thanks.